Welcome to Zenai, the interactive podcast providing resources for living a better life. I am Zenai Shea. I'm your conduit, your coach, and your catalyst to that better life. A coach draws out hidden potential in the subject. A conduit provides a connection, and a catalyst sparks change. So today's episode is titled Benediction. And um, a benediction is a blessing. It's a blessing normally given at the end of a journey or at the end of a ceremony um, when someone is leaving, going somewhere else. And so you bless them. You send them on their way with you know, high hopes for wherever they're traveling to. Um, and you're thankful that you had that time with them. Um, and so today's episode, um, I wanted to start off with a libation. This is water. Baba Fana, who um, is going to be a big part of this episode, would say that water is a conduit and that water connects us to, you know, life and to each other and to even the people that have gone on. And so he would take water and he would say, you know, that he's going to pour out this water in, in remembrance of those that have gone on and that we're going to call out the names of those that we want to remember. So I want to remember, you know, Baba Fana, and I want to remember my mother, Cynthia Garner Baptiste, and I want to remember my father, Willie Baptiste, and I want to remember Raymond Tibbs, who passed earlier this week. And um, I want to remember all of the beautiful artists and drummers and musicians and poets you know, Maya Angelou that have gone, you know, Maya Angelou and Miles Davis and just all the beautiful people that we have in our history. Um, do you want to call out anything? Um, uh, Bernadine Norris Cole. Ashe. Ashe. So, you know, Ashe means so be it. It means so many things, but when you finish, you normally say Ashe. And so, as I said, we're here to kind of remember those people that have gone on, especially those people that have gone on due to COVID. And I met Baba Fana. I was not too far from where I am right now. I'm at 4803 on Main Street at the Key. And I actually went to an open mic at a place called Capone's. And there was um, a huge band on the stage, and Baba Fana was a drummer. And he had gotten up and he was playing with the saxophonists, and they were quite incredible. And then a poet got up and did a poem, and then I got up and did a poem. And, and then the open mic was over. I had gotten there a little late, and he was, I just had seen this, this band play with Baba Fana and the saxophonists and this poet. That was all that I got to see. Of this open mic and then um, I was a very like last performer and so it was still early it was like 6 30 um, and I was coming to the key to have a show here and I, I felt that I would be able to stop by there on the way here and run in and you know maybe uh, meet some people pass out some flyers because their open mic was ending and who knew you know maybe people would want some more entertainment so um, I invited him to come and he and the saxophonist came and about three other people came from that venue over to the key and he brought his bongos up on the stage and um, played behind the saxophonist and played behind all of the poets except for old school who didn't want her to play um, and he was so incredible and from that moment on um, we were friends and he kept inviting me to come to his class. He had a class at the Shrine of Black Madonna called Conversation in Culture and History. And he probably asked me eight times before I came. And I remember uh, when I walked into the class, all of his students were sitting in a circle. And uh, you know, he invited me to come in and, and have a seat. And he passed with this paper around. And this was the paper that he passed, and I'm going to read it. This was the very first thing that I heard him say in his class. In the beginning, our ancestors knew not. They studied for 4,000 years. They learned all there was to know. They taught others. Then came the Mafa, the great disasters. Enslavers made it illegal for Africans to read and write. They were forced to forget all they had learned and taught. After 400 years of forgetting, they forgot they had forgotten. 
that changes today. I will remember for them. I will read for them. I will write for them. I will teach for them. I will make certain they are never forgotten again. And that was the very first thing I heard him say in his class. And if you're sitting out there and you don't know how profound what I just read is, this was not something he wrote. Let me give credit to the person who actually said this. This was, I'll read the bottom. This was a, a quote from Anthony Browder's 2017 lecture at the Shrine Cultural Center in Houston, Texas. It was a pledge that he had the people in that audience make. And I kept it because I believed every word of it. I believe that, that I came from people who knew a lot of science and history and philosophy and that it was taken from us when we came over on ships and that it was my duty to remember them. It was my duty to read. It was my duty to write. It was my duty to teach. It was my duty to speak. And when I said that, when I read these words, I meant it. I, I, it and that was how he started his class, with the idea that you weren't coming to this class just to learn about African culture, but you were coming to this class to become a conduit of African culture and to teach and to remember and to speak and to write and to do whatever you did for the good of the community. And uh, so that's a high standard when you're walking into a room and you don't know anybody in the room and you make a pledge before you even take this class, you know. Um, so that's the kind of person that he was and I remember as I was listening on that first day of that first class that I took, I had felt my whole life in conflict with myself as a black person. I had felt like I didn't exactly fit in. Um, and he began to teach us things. He said, you know, America teaches you that you live in a, a pie. And if one person gets a slice, there's less for everybody else. Well, that's not an African concept. In Africa, there's a concept of abundance, that there is more than enough for everybody, that we all can come and have our fill and feed each other, and there will no, be no one hungry because no one will take too much and no one will have too little because we are Ubuntu. I am because you are. You are because I am. And so therefore, I have to take care of you and you have to take care of me because we are one. And that was a beautiful concept. I had never heard that word before. It's actually part of the Kwanzaa tradition, which I had heard that word before but never had really participated in Kwanzaa. Uh, now it's something that I do every year. And so that was the beginning of my journey into learning that there was a different way of thinking about things. There was a different way of looking at the world that I didn't have to um, believe what I was taught. In fact, I could unlearn everything I was taught. Um, and he talked about the concept of time, you know, how in America we're always on the clock and we're always worried about what time it is and are we late for something? And he said, you know, if you were going to work in, in an African village and you got there late, your boss would say, why are you late? And you would say, oh, on the way I met, I met a Fendi and, and he told me about his wife and his daughters and his goat and his, his kid, you know, and um, we just talked for a few minutes and I'm sorry that I'm late, but, uh, you know, I, I just had that conversation and that made me run behind a little bit. And the boss would say, well, how is Effendi? How is his wife? How is his kid? How are his sheep and goats, you know? And it was the concept that time was kind of malleable, that people were more important than time, that we weren't just punching the clock. And he said, you know, in African villages, there are no prices that you go and you barter, that you have to communicate 
and, and determine the value of something, and you have to haggle, you know. Um, and just all of these concepts were very new to me, you know, and, and just the idea of there's a whole way, a whole different way of doing things, there's a whole different way of living, and that what I was taught isn't the only way, that there are other ways of thinking about things, there are other ways of doing things. And it just opened up my mind and my perspective, and, and even those of you that are watching this live or seeing it later on YouTube, you see that my hair is natural. Well, you know, I was raised uh, with relaxer, and I had a relaxer in my hair when I went to his class, and he was one of the first people that said to me, why, why do you straighten your hair? And I mean, it's your choice, and I love you anyway. But you do realize, you know, that you don't have to do that. I know that society may say that it's, it's professional, but what about just exploring your natural beauty? What about just exploring what, what your hair would do without those chemicals? Just, just even maybe just trying it out, seeing if you like it, you know? And if you don't, it's okay. It's no judgment, but why not try it, you know? And, and just the permission to try new things and to um, think about things differently was, was really freeing and, um, you know, I'm going to let John Ross Dyke, you know, I've had Baba Fanal on four of my shows, um, Adore Your Ancestry, Awakening, um, what it was it, Community Economics, I think it was, Cooperative Economics, and the, the fourth one I cannot remember right now. So he actually got to meet him um, on two different occasions, and he listened to all the episodes because he edited all the episodes. So I wanted you to kind of talk about what what you thought, your perspective, what you possibly learned from him, you know? Um, you're right, like I, I met him four times. It, was, it wasn't brief, but it wasn't a long period of time. I'm aware of what the Shrine of the Black Madonna was because that was the first place that I ever did a play at. And to know that he was associated with the Shrine of the Black Madonna made sense. Everything in there is Afrocentric, has a feeling of home, has a it has an aura to it. So when I met him, that aura wasn't too different from the Shrine of the Black Madonna. But what I got from him was a man of principles. Uh, I remember distinctively you telling me, I need you to be on time. Because, you know, um, my guest today, he's very structured and you know, we just want to start on time. And as soon as we finished the show, he was in and out. When he was in the show, he gave it all. Didn't waver. Um, and it brings me that sometimes when people are engulfed in something, it, there is no wavering. You are who you are, especially when you come into the light of who you need to be. You, you can't change that. And that's one of the things that I got from him, is that everything he said, I felt like he lived. I felt like he lived it, he believed it. It was, you know, something that, you know, some, sometimes when lights turn on and people get around certain people, they become somebody else. But for me, I think that in meeting him the very few times that I met him, he was the same way with me, even if he never met me before. It's the same way with you, he's the same way with everybody. And uh, that's something that I got off off the top, just meeting him the first time. The first, the very first podcast that I edited of yours, when I saw him in there, he was the same person when I actually recorded him. And you know, that's, that's one thing that I got from him. Yeah, he was, um, he was himself, definitely, and, and he was very unapologetic about who he was, and, and, and he shared just his heart. Um, he told us about, you know, growing up in Brooklyn and, and the people that he looked up to, the people that he was around, and, and um, you know, being involved with the Black Panthers, being involved with Farrakhan, being involved with a lot of different people. It's rare that I've met someone who can fit in with any group. Mm. I mean, Christian, Muslim, uh, Jewish, uh, non-religious, uh, young, old. I mean, this was a man who taught children how to drum, was constantly teaching drum classes, constantly doing drum circles, had so much energy. I mean, I 
you know, I can't even imagine how much energy he had because he would come to my shows and we'd be up late at night and he would be coming from somewhere else where he had already performed and coming to do another show with us. And so just had a tremendous amount of energy and just so much wisdom and peace and gentleness. Um, in his class, as I mentioned, he would sit us in a circle and he would always put someone in the center of the circle at the end of the class and he would tell them, you know, put your feet on the floor, put your hands on your legs and close your eyes. And then he would just have everyone in the circle go around and speak life to that person. Tell them, you know, how beautiful they were, how, how wonderful their spirit was, the, what they heard from them in, in the group, you know, and how that inspired them. And, and so it was just so uplifting that every, every time we had class that someone went into the center of that circle and they were, they were uplifted and they were um, just embraced, you know, and, and I will be the first to say, I definitely haven't known him as long as some people who may be watching this video. Um, I've only known him a little over two years, you know, but um, he was very impactful in my life. Like I told you, he opened my mind to possibilities. Um, and besides that, when I went to the shrine, um, I had left the church like six years ago, had not been to any kind of spiritual anything until I started going to the shrine. And so the conversations in African culture and history was very much like my church. Um, and he, he is a minister, so he was very much like my pastor. And at one point after I started going there, my mom was diagnosed with a terminal illness. And uh, I was going when I could get there on Saturdays when I wasn't um, at the hospice or at the hospital or you know caring for her um, at her home. Um, I would stop by the shrine and go to class. And, you know, I remember on one occasion, at the end of class, he would always ask everybody, how are you doing? How are you? And he said, that was a simple question, a question everybody asks all the time. You know, and he said, how are you? And he's looking straight at me, and I just burst into tears. I didn't even have any words. And uh, everybody in the class came and just held me, talked to me. And after that, he started calling me, checking on me. This was not somebody that had to do that. He didn't have to do that. Nobody was paying him to do it. I wasn't his congregant. And, to, you know, I didn't even come to the Shrine of Black Madonna Church. I just came to the class. But he took it upon himself to call me, to talk to me to encourage me to, to be my father. My father had passed, um, what was it, 2014. So last year, when my mom was dying, he stepped into that role. He didn't have to, you know. And um, I didn't expect him to. It wasn't even anything that would have ever crossed my mind to even think that anybody would do or even ask anybody to do. But that was the kind of person that he was. He saw a need and he filled it. He didn't ask permission. He just saw a need and he filled it. Um, and so I know that there are people out there in Facebook land that are hurting today because if he did that for me and he only knew me for maybe what? six months before that, I can't even imagine the kind of impact that he had on people that he had been in their life since they were kids, since they were young, decades, you know, he was just that kind of person where um, you weren't the same after knowing him. You just weren't the same. He, he lit up the room. He had such energy. And, and I was talking to Kay Jones, who is my co-host, 
She uh, is a singing comedian. We were on the phone late last night, midnight last night, because uh, he was a big part of Laughs and Lyrics. We have a comedy, music, and poetry show. He came to, I think, four of our shows and performed. And she was like, you could feel it when he walked into the room. The energy he brought was just such a positive energy. And we did this show on the solstice. It was like December 18th or 19th, two years ago, at the Isles. And Otis, you know, Uncle Otis, um, with a vegan ice cream, helped me put together this show. And we had drummers, and Cayenne was there, and she sang, and she, uh, uh, I don't know if you call it singing, but there's the sound, the sound that they make, you know, this, I cannot do it. I cannot do it. But it's, it's, a, it's a chant almost. Uh, beautiful. So they brought different instruments and the drum circle was there. And we were basically bringing, you know, bringing in the new year and, and, and saying goodbye to the old year. And... You know, we had everybody write on cards what they wanted to get rid of in their life. And we had this big fire pit outside. And everybody was throwing those cards into the fire pit. And this drum circle was going. And the energy in the room was unlike anything that I've ever experienced in my life. You know, Baba Fana got up there and he started the, he started off the show. Uh, Darla Broden did the libation that night and started off the show with the drums and there was a drum circle and there was all of these beautiful drummers drumming in unison and and the chants and it was just incredible it was so healing and i know that there were people in the audience who had never experienced anything like that never experienced a drum circle never experienced uh, sage you know there was a sage ceremony um, but I know that they were touched and uplifted and changed, you know, and, and Kay was just talking about how she just really changed after that night and her life kind of took off in a different direction just because of the positive energy that was in the room that just made you feel like anything was possible, you know, anything was possible. And uh, that was the kind of person that he was and, just made you feel like anything was possible and you know it's, it's just incredible when you have people like that and they they take people under their wings they change they change lives you know and um, the Shrine of the Black Madonna provides so many different opportunities for people to come together and to learn about African culture. They have a museum in there to slavery. They have books in there. Um, they have classes there. They have workshops there. They have the vendors market, you know. So another thing that I wanted to say, and, and I'm gonna let you chime in if you have anything you wanna add, you know, sometimes one person brings a network. And when I met Baba Fana, I didn't just meet Baba Fana, I met Vanessa Latrice, and I met um, Aisha Shaid, and I met, you know, Roshan Justice, and I met all of these people. I could probably name 50 people who all had their own um, avenues. You know, I met um, Vivi, you know, who does the teas, and I, I met so many people through his class, and then we went off and we did things together, you know. Um, and, and they invited me to other events. They, you know, helped me to, to, I guess, go off in different directions. You know, I met Akua Gray um, because of Baba Fana. And I went through, you know, my comedic initiation with uh, the Sacred Woman book. Um, so some people don't just bring themselves, they bring a village, you know. And um, so I feel that I got, in a sense, a, a bigger family, a bigger community through him because of his class, because of the connections that I made in the class, because of, you know, um, the vendors that were friends with him. And, and, you know, as I was looking at Facebook last night and Instagram, I just saw so many people 
that were remembering him. You know, I saw Outspoken Bean who was reciting a poem with Baba Fana playing in the background. He's the poet laureate right now of Houston. I saw Duchess Witt talk about how Baba would play behind her. I, taught, I just saw Cayenne um, talking about Baba and, and putting up her pictures of, of, you know, all the times that he was playing the drums behind her. It was just, it was just, it was so much that at the top of the screen when you typed, it, typed in his name, it said trending on Facebook, trending. Mm. That's how many people were posting about him. So he was truly, you know, an icon and, and the people who are out there um, who've never heard of this man, don't know his wisdom. Like I said, he's on four of my podcasts, and, you know, and for a while, for about six months, one of the podcasts that he did, Adore Your Ancestry, was number one on the podcast. Um, so it's, I think it's number five or number six right now, but so many people, I have subscribers in uh, 53 cities and 30 countries the last time I looked. So what he was teaching wasn't just something for Houston, wasn't just something for the shrine, wasn't just something for black people. It was something that everyone could grab a hold to and everyone could be inspired by and everyone could be um, uplifted and encouraged by and enlightened by, you know, so you want to... You know, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned change, um, iconic, uh, and I think of historical figures like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King who were able to change the course of uh, their, of African Americans' lives in the fact of, hey, sometimes some people were uh, choosing violence, they started to choose peace. Some people believed in Jesus Christ and, and believed that, you know, they could do it this way. And Malcolm X taught people um, Islamic ways. And I think of uh, how influential you used the word conduit. And I think of Baba Fana as one of the premier conduits in Houston. Somebody who could bring people together and begin to change how your outlook on life. I think that uh, speaking on Malcolm X, you know, I remember watching, of course, Malcolm X is before my time, but I remember watching Malcolm X in the movie by Denzel. I remember how he spoke vividly, how he was a changed man after prison, but how profound he was when he spoke. Every time he spoke, you could feel it in your soul. And you know, I mean, this is a testament to how Denzel is, who he is as an actor, but it changed me. I stopped eating pork after that movie in college. And when I think about it for now, I think of somebody who, like I said, is just, I didn't know him. But when I hear you speak about him, I can feel what he meant to you in your life. I can feel him through the podcast. And there were certain times in the podcast where I just, you know, I would just sit back and get lost in what he was saying because it was just so, it was well said. You know, there was, you know, a lot of times when people talk, and they're not certain about what they say, they stutter. They kind of pause to think. But when I listened to him talk, there was nothing like that. He was affirming what he said, and he was just an all-around good person. I didn't know him, but I saw, I've seen the pictures on Instagram and on Facebook of how people adored him. You know, without the national acclaim, he is our modern-day Malcolm X. He is our modern-day Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And um, he needs a day. You know, speaking of Malcolm X, I, I go back to the movie, and Malcolm was a hoodlum mm. when he went to prison. Mm. He was uh, doing drugs, mm. doing crime, um, and just really had absolutely no direction. And there was one person that came into his life. I don't know the name of that man, Maybe somebody out there in the audience does. Maybe you can type it. Baines. Yeah, in prison his name was Baines. So I, I wanted to just shine a light on Baines for a minute because that is the person that came to Malcolm X with no judgment, with only love, with only, hey, why don't you pick up a dictionary? Why don't you look up what the word black means? Look up white, you know, 
come here, I want to talk to you. You know, let me just let me just share what I believe. Let me just share what's changed my life. Um, no judgment, no judgment, no no criticism, no uh, harshness. Just love and acceptance and, and and just wisdom and knowledge. And to me, that's exactly the kind of person the Bible for now was. He did not care where you were in your life. You could be as lost as Malcolm X was before. You know, he came to his, in a sense, conversion and enlightenment. And Baba Fana would just hug you and love you and, and, and just throw you some, you know, some wisdom here and there, some nuggets, and um, just bring you along. And he would push you to change, but he would just give you the option and say, hey, think about this, look at this, consider this, here's some knowledge, here's, you know, and to me, that's, what happened to Malcolm X, and he went from being lost, being destructive, um, being purposeless, to being a leader of men, and being driven to, to impact the culture in a positive way, and impact the community in a positive way. So when you have a person like Baba Fanal, let me just say this, they do that for people. You know, they see people who have potential and they they push them a little bit, not not too much, but they push them and they say there's greatness in you. You know, and they, they, they encourage <coughs> excuse me, and foster that greatness. I was gonna say that, you know, when you said that Baba Baba Fanon looked at you after your mom was in the hospice and everything, he saw it in you like that man, like Brother Ben saw it in things that in the movie. He saw it in it. That's why he was able so drawn to him to help him change. So I was gonna say that Baba Fana saw in you, saw that you could be a great leader in your own path. Well, you know, I, I'm doing what I can, so <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm doing this tonight. I wish I had everybody that knew him talking about him because to be honest, they probably can say more than I could say. They probably know more than I know. They might have traveled with him to Ghana and traveled with him all over. I know he performed all over the nation, all over the world. Um, I, I have a very limited experience, but I have a platform. And one thing about us as black people, sometimes we, we um, how can I put it, we make excuses. I don't want to make any excuses. I just wanted to say that this was a man that changed my life. This was a man that I knew for just a little while, but in that short amount of time, two and a half years, he changed my life. And I have an ability to sit here and tell you this. And so it would be remiss of me not to do that. I owe him that much. Sure. And uh, I just wanted to say for everybody that is dealing with his loss, you know, my heart goes out to you. Everyone that is dealing with any loss, I've lost two people this week, you know, uh, lost 10 other people in the last six years. Grief is difficult, but you don't have to do it alone. And it's better when you can uh, remember what that person did for you and the blessing they were to you. And I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful that I got to know this man. So grateful. And so, you know, I don't want to belabor it tonight, uh, but I did want to speak my piece. I did want to go on record saying how beautiful he was, how much he was loved, how much the city of Houston and probably the world is going to miss him. And uh, I wanted to thank you guys for joining us, you know, and Please share. Uh, 
not only his story, but the stories of all of the people that have been positive influences. We hear so much about the people that do evil. We hear so much about the people that are destructive and uh, tear down our community. But the people who lift it up are sometimes left in obscurity. Nobody's talking about them. Nobody's saying anything about them. Um, that shouldn't be. I started off this podcast. I'm going to read the statement again because I think it's powerful. I think it's a wonderful pledge that this man had his audience make and that Baba gave to us, you know, as we came into his class. So it said, in the beginning, our ancestors knew not. They studied for 4,000 years. They learned all there was to know. They taught others. Then came the Mafa, the great disaster, and slavers made it illegal for Africans to read and write. They were forced to forget all they had learned and taught. After 400 years of forgetting, they forgot they had forgotten. That changes today. I will remember for them. I will read for them. I will write for them. I will teach for them. I will make certain they are never forgotten again. And so I want to go back over each part of the, that pledge. I will remember for them. We should be remembering the people that have gone on. You know, we, we started off with the libation, calling out the names of people who have gone on. You know, it's important to remember our ancestors. I, I have a guided journal where I have, you know, a space for people to remember their ancestors and to look to them as role models. I will read for them. You know, my dad told me when I was a kid, there used to be a saying, if you don't want a black person to know something, put it in a book. <laughs> and he told me, he said, uh, you will not be one of those black people. You will be a reader because you will be able to find out what they want to hide from you. You will read. And I do read. And I push reading. I push books on every podcast. I talk about books. Baba Fana brought books to our class. He brought picture books. He bought all kinds of books on African culture and history. I went and bought, I don't even know how many books, at least three that I can remember just because he brought them to class and I went and read them. Um, he was a reader. He believed in reading. He believed in teaching. The next one is, I will teach for them. Whatever you know, Whatever you've been taught, teach others. You know, Maya said, when you learn, teach. Um, I will write for them. You may not be a poet, you may not be a, a great writer, but you, when you put those posts on Instagram and Facebook, write some positive things sometimes. I mean, we can all joke and laugh and be silly and stuff, but, but write some stuff that uplifts to people. Write some wisdom down sometimes, you know? Write for them, write for those ancestors that couldn't write. Write for those ancestors that couldn't share their knowledge in that way, you know? And, you know, the last thing said, I will make certain they are never forgotten again. So, this podcast is going to go out today, tonight, is live, and then we'll put it up later on the. Uh, platforms and some people are going to remember his name some people are going to remember other people that they lost and and stop uh forgetting them you know uh, i do love one thing about facebook it, it brings up those memories <laughs> what, what what is it you know this happened a year ago this happened two years ago this happened three years ago i've even seen it go up to six years ago i do like that. It's it's interesting to see where you were a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, five years ago, six years ago. And I can say this: um, had I not met Baba Fana, of course, it's just speculation, but I can guarantee I probably wouldn't have this natural hair. I probably wouldn't have gone through a committed initiation. I probably wouldn't know half the people that I know um, that have been very inspiring in my life. Um, all of the people that I met at the shrine, 
all of the vendors that I've met at the shrine. Um, just, I didn't even know the shrine existed. I, I mean, I think I heard the name of it once or twice, but you hear lots of names and you never go there. You know what I mean? I, I mean, so he was the reason I went. I went because he asked me to go. About eight times. About about a month and a half. <laughs> you know, maybe two months. He kept asking and asking and asking. The man was persistent. And I kept saying, you know, I said, well, so if I don't go, he's just going to keep asking me. <laughs> so I might as well go. And I don't know what I was so afraid of. I don't know why I didn't go the first time or the second time or the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time or the sixth time or the seventh time. I don't know why it took so long, but um, I'm glad I went. I'm glad I got to know him better. I'm glad that uh, I learned from him. I'm glad that he showed me so many different ways to think about life and the world and so many possibilities. People hear me talk about affirmations and power of words. You know, I didn't always do this. I didn't always do this. I didn't grow up doing this. I was taught this. I was exposed to this. I started doing affirmations in the last four years, and I started really upping them and being much more cognizant of my words once I got around Baba Fana. Because I saw the power that somebody's words could have. I saw it in action. I saw it up close and personal. I saw his words change people's lives. It made me think, wow. You know, it doesn't take years. It could take one sentence. It could take one phrase. I've seen it. I see it happening. I became much more cognizant of what I was saying and thinking and exposing myself to. So I just wanted to say that and I wanted to go back to you if you had anything else that you wanted to say before we wrap up tonight. No, uh, some, some people live up uh, their words and their actions um, are unable, you can't erase them. And, uh, you know, Bob Fana is definitely a staple of the community. I live right across the street from this rock in Black And, uh, you know, every time I heard him, he was just profound. Makes me want to go back and really dive and dig into what he was saying because there's a message. And the last thing that I want to say, we started off this episode saying it was benediction. It's, it's a blessing on, you know, at the end of someone's journey or as they're getting ready to go on to something else. Tell the people in your life that you love them. Tell them how much they mean to you. Tell them how they change your life how they impacted your life. One thing that I can say, and I'm glad that I can say, is that the two people that I lost this week, of course we know that they still exist in spirit form, but they knew I loved them. They knew I appreciated them. They knew they meant a lot to me. They knew I looked up to them. They knew that they, you know, were my heart. I needed them. And I appreciated them. And it wasn't a secret, at least to them. It may be a secret to you guys out there who don't even know me and don't even know any of that, but it wasn't a secret to them. Um, so talk to the people that you have around you because nobody expected him to be gone today. Nobody expected that. You know, uh, nobody saw this coming. Uh, and a lot of us are still digesting that it's happened and we'll still be digesting that it happened however long it takes us to digest that it happened but um, seize the day enjoy the time you have with those that you love hold them close you know uplift them um, check on the people that you haven't talked to in a while see how they're doing because we live in perilous times and uh, tomorrow is not promised. But I want to thank you guys.
guys for joining us for Benediction. I want to thank you for listening in. And for everyone who's lost somebody, I want to say again that my heart goes out to you. My love and my positive energy is with you. And for everyone who knows Baba Fana, my heart goes out to you. And my love and positive energy goes out to you. And thank you for joining us. And may you walk in synergy.